Good. Well, it's not quite afternoon yet, but I don't want to be the last thing standing between you guys and lunch, so let's get to this, and I'll keep it as brief as I can. The problem. Meteorologists make lots of weather maps. Lots of them. So many weather maps. That's what we do all day, every day, is looking at weather maps to see what's going on, see what happened. It's the bread and butter of meteorology, and it's great, and, you know, Tools to produce maps are important to our field, and so here are some examples of the kind of things we're doing with MetPy today. The legacy solution to this problem is a tool called GEMPAC, which it stands for General Meteorological Package, so just based on that name, you kind of get a flair for what era of computing this, this tool came out of. Um, it was the 1980s. Um, it's a command line scripting tool, kind of in the vein of GMT, where you have these individual tools that you are piping and scripting together to generate analysis graphics. Um, it also includes some um, graphical user interface type applications as well. Um, it has a lot of plotting capabilities in terms of the different meteorological specific analyses we do. And it also has a lot of calculated parameters. And that's one of its core features is what we call the grid diagnostics. You take gridded data and calculate some kind of um, quantity on there, say taking temperature and relative humidity and maybe calculating dew point. And so here's an example out of a tool that ships with Genpack called GARP. This is one of those graphical applications and this is, this is its state of the art in terms of graphical output. The UI, well that's what it looks like. Another example from Genpack of Nmap2, I'm just trying to give you a flair for these are the kind of graphics that this tool, which is beloved by meteorologists for its power and, and um, ease of use and the rapidity with which you can create new graphics and you know, just explore what's going on in today's weather. Um, here's more of a static type image you'd be using Genpack to generate with a script. So now that we're in 2018 and not the 80s, Genpack's kind of really been creaking under its age here. Um, you've got an ancient technology stack it's built on. I mean, those GUIs, it's motif. Um, I don't even, most platforms, you can barely get those on anymore. Um, it's not flexible with regards to data formats. So getting data in NetCDF, for instance, is non-trivial to get into Genpack. And then as new revisions come on, it, it, you have to, you basically pre-process all your data to get it into Genpack makes its data model nice and flexible and gets to a lot of power, but you do have to do a lot, especially if you want to use it for research applications. Now you've got some arbitrary data you've, you've been working with and getting into Genpack is, well, especially for the average meteorologist, nigh impossible. If you're really dedicated, you could get in there and hack the Fortran or C and get it working. And the big, um, the big problem with Genpack these days is that the National Weather Service and the National Center for Environmental Prediction have moved on to new tool packages for graphical use by forecasters, and so they are no longer um, developing GEMPAC, and so the resources that were going to it are no longer there, and so that leaves a lot of legacy code that, if it's going to be continued forward, has to be picked up by the community, and, you know, that has its own challenges. So, I work on a package called MetPy. It's a Python toolkit for doing meteorological things. Um, we do things like file format support, plotting, calculations, all in Python. And its mission in life is to gracefully replace GEMPAC um, and just provide a nice place to we'll move into Python as we move away from these legacy applications. So, this, this is all nice logical following here. We'll just swap out GEMPAC for Python. So, Genpack scripting analysis. You're literally using shell scripts here as your scripting language. You're also then, it's a command line tool that you would set a bunch of variables in, so you're using input redirection to actually do your programming of the Genpack tools. Um, an important note here, it is more of a declarative style versus imperative or, or uh, yeah, versus imperative style of programming. So you're setting individual variables. You're not calling functions. You're not telling Genpack what to do. You're just telling it what you want, and it goes about generating the plots. And so here's what this looks like, and let me try and zoom out so we can get the full beauty here. Um, so this is actually C shell, not even bash. And so you're sourcing an environment file that contains a bunch of other things. 
you're using you know the Unix command line date utility to try and figure out what the day's date is and doing some manipulation to turn it into the date format you want. And then here, we're going to call the gridded contour routine and say, OK, until then, we're redirecting input. And I'm going to tell you all the variables you should be doing. So technically speaking, you could just start the app and sit there and execute these lines one by one and generate your map. <coughs> and then at the bottom here, um, just because I like showing this, here's where it tells it to run the utility and actually do it. And then you have to have two blank lines, not one, not three. Well, three might work, but not one. Two blank lines. And then E to exit, and then you hit the end of your, your input. So that's what, that was state-of-the-art scripting weather analysis from the 80s and 90s. So we'll just use Python. Python's a clearly superior scripting analysis solution here. And we'll just drop in the Python code, and life will be easier, right? This is great. Uh, there's a page of code. I don't expect anyone to be able to read that, but just get an idea for the magnitude. We went from that, which is crufty, but that's much longer. 43 lines of code, and that's without any of the white space and wrapping stuff. That is just individual statements being executed, and 30 different function calls and methods to get something comparable to what Gempack was doing for us in about a third to a half the code size. This does not make me happy. It makes me even, you know, writing it myself, I'm not a forecaster, I'm a coder, so I, I don't mind writing code, but when I get into workshops and have to teach this kind of thing, then it drives me nuts, because then having to walk students through that much, it takes us an hour just to get the most basic of analyses done. So the Python stack is really powerful, and it has general functionality, which is great. With that much flexibility and power comes just, in generally, a, a lot of verboseness to what it takes to accomplish even the most basic of tasks. And, and you know, it's a real, quote unquote, programming language. And so you don't want to be trying to in introduce this to freshmen in your intro to meteorology course who haven't really encountered any kind of programming. And, but you want to hit the ground running and get them used to generating their own weather analyses and just getting acquainted with the processes we go through in meteorology. So how can we make Python more like Gempack? So let's go back to our configuration here. We see this, we're setting some variables, and then we're running something. So let's do a quick conversion here. And that's what, just a, just spitballing here and just trying to turn this into Python. We turn it into getting something out of the date time module and use date.today and maybe use some F strings to format some of the code. And you know, that's not bad, that's, that's a decent start. Now, you know, that's, it's all just setting variables and running something, which would mean these would be global variables, and, you know, that would be an abomination against nature to have all these global variables. We don't want that. We're in modern structured code. But, well, maybe this. Just a few simple classes. Make a map and set these attributes. We want a contour analysis, so we'll set, create contour and set a bunch of attributes in that. And that still looks a lot like what we did with Gempack, and a lot less like the 43-line monstrosity we started with. So that's a nice theoretical thing. There was no code that we really did to get there. We just kind of threw some things together. But you know, if you go through the effort of doing this and then do a little more to talk about getting remote data here, we download some data from a thread server using OpenDAP and X-Array. But this is actual live code in the notebook. And if I was to run it, I'm not testing the demo gods here. Here's what you can get out. You can actually use that, those few lines of code, and get out a nice weather map. And then we can add to it. And this time, I've taken what was contouring some forecast model output, and now I've added a satellite image underneath. And that's not quite showing up as large as I want. Um, again, adding to it, OK, we can image plot and set a couple attributes. And bam, now we've got this more complicated analysis where you can be uh, combining different sources of data together, and it did not take that much effort to get there. So how did we get get there? We started, you know, Matplotlib, Cartopy. At least that's my core stack on things, and of course I work on MetPy, so that's 
underpinning the meteorology here. Um, so we have X-ray under there, and that's doing, we have some custom X-ray accessors doing the CF metadata interpretation that handles setting up our projections based on what's in the data rather than requiring users to do it. So there's some magic there that's going on. Also picking out some dimensions based on the CF metadata. And then we also have traitlets sitting under there. So if you're not familiar, traitlets, it's an attribute framework, for lack of a better term I could come up with, that is started with IPython and Jupyter. And that's how they do their configuration management and a lot of other things. So it provides validation for attributes to make sure you use the proper types. It also provides event notification so that when attributes change their values, you can get notified of those values being changed and you can do some event-driven style programming. Now, all those things I just did to make those images, that was completely overkill. I don't need event notification. I just need, you know, set attributes and generate a plot. But some of the part about replacing Gempack tools, it's not just about scripting analysis. It is this simplified command line interface where we don't want programmers. We don't want people to have to figure out, I need to import these six names from these three different modules. We kind of want to be able to drive this just as a configuration file, essentially. So that one thing Traitlets gives us there is the validation for when users make things. It'll validate that you gave things the proper type within those files. And then the GUI interface. There's something about traitlets in the IPython widget framework that just sounds interesting. So let's see what I touch. All right. So as the theme of the day goes, it's Jupiter time. <laughs> so here I will tempt the demo gods. So this looks a lot like what we did before. I'm just combining the two data sources here. This is using the Jupyter Matplotlib or the IPyMPL plugin. So this is running a Matplotlib figure as a widget within the Jupyter, Jupyter Lab environment here. And so this is just our static figure. Well, somewhat static. We can you know zoom in if we want and do things. But most important here now is I can import a few widgets from the IPy widgets project create some very basic user interface type things. A quick set of link up each of these UI elements to the attributes we were setting before in the script. But now I have a UI I can play with here. And so I can, for instance, change the plotted data. You can't really see the contours right now because I have only have one, so let's crank that up to maybe 50 contours and let that churn through. And for temperature, maybe black's not appropriate, but we want red color, so we can go in there and change that. And now, I mean, we've seen these kind of things a lot of this week, but what I like here is I've taken the same scripting analysis that I'm intending to teach freshmen or sophomores or early college meteorology students, and now it's a very easy gateway into now doing these into an interactive setting and developing some more canned widget UI tools that we can use with that same framework and we're not having to move very far from where we started. So I think that's all I had there. So I don't know how to start that back where it was. I'll just do this the slow stupid way. All right. So, just wrapping up what I've done here is base, I have implemented, you know, a beginning of a declarative plotting interface here based on that plot living car to pie. I mean, it's practically trying to put together a domain specific language here in terms of meteorological plotting. Um, and X-Array works really well in terms of hiding a lot of these details and allowing us to have some magical functionality, at least in terms of taking CF metadata for projections and turning that into Cardify objects, hiding that detail away, you know, it's two, two class, initial, class initializations, but it's also probably one of the harder parts to get people to understand how to take that metadata and turn it into Cardify objects. So that's a great magic to have hidden. And traitlets, especially once you get your head wrapped around it, turning that into things you can easily link up with the IPy widgets is amazing. I was blown away with just those three lines. I mean, a small cell and I had a GUI. Um, oh, that cell didn't get split. Okay, future work. 
um, I need to migrate this prototype code to something that we can actually ship because I took careful pains here to not show you guys any of that code because it's its own special abomination. Um, but it just, you know, it's something you just sit there and hack together until you get the interface you want and then we'll go back and clean it up. Uh, I need to add some more plotting types. We have image plots and contour plots, but maybe some P color meshes or um, quiver barbs type plots are going to be important for meteorological analysis. Uh, we need to further develop the notebook UI here and play with expanding the, you know, just see what's useful here in terms of what attributes to expose or maybe how to go about um, baking that into the different plot types as far as, a, you know, automatically popping up in the notebook. Um, and then there's the command line tool aspect of this in terms of just having this Python file that no one is actually importing anything and it looks like a Gempack script and then have a, just a basic driver program that uses as a configuration to do the plotting. Um, and then also just all the knobs. Gempack does a lot of things where I want New York and so it knows how to draw a map that goes right to New York rather than you having to specify manual bounding boxes and a lot of those quality of life type improvements um, we need to implement in this interface. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge uh, Kevin Gobert at Valparaiso, Valparaiso University did a lot to help inspire this work and help um, bounce ideas off of him in terms of the Gempack thing because he's a big Gempack guy. And then acknowledge the generous NSF's uh, funding we've had to work on this work at Unidata and MetPy itself. With that, I'll take some questions. Time for quite a few questions. Who wants to go first? Your hand in front of your face, I couldn't see for a minute. Hey, uh, great stuff, Ryan and, and John as well. Um, just wondering, maybe I missed some of this, but how allied is this into the MetPy project? Is, is, and if it's not terribly well allied, I mean, does this kind of, kind of split the resources and like you're having a MetPy development and then you know, maybe something that's almost like a GemPy development? Uh, this is very much going into MetPy. Um, what we're thinking here is I want it to be an honor ramp, and I probably should have talked about this a little more, is one of the things about the simplified interface that I don't like about Gempack is it's going from there to programming is a big step. Whereas with this, the same matplotlib objects are underpinning all this. And so it is my intention that we're not going to have all the customization you could ever possibly want exposed as these simplified attributes. But you have, hey, just grab, just, grab the matplotlib axis object out, and then you can go through the same API that exists. And so you have something that, you know, is intentionally limited in terms of its initial feature scope and the Gempack declarative interface, but is a ready spot that you can extend then using the traditional um, imperative style of programming. And so it should be something that scales up from the basics up to more advanced things. And my intention, at least right now, is for this just to live within uh, MetPy's plotting functionality. Great talk, Ryan. Um, I'm right here. Uh, so it looks good when, you, when you're able to have the declarative interface and then also create the, the widgets to, so you can mess around with it. Have you gone full circle so you can go back to the declarative interface after you've fiddled with it? That is one of the other things that has occurred to me is be able to, yeah, you, you fiddle with something, you get the attributes, and then you want to save, serialize that back out that state so that you can get the script like that. And that has occurred to me. I haven't tried it yet. Um, I don't think... The current iteration of the code is good enough to, to do that well yet. Anyone else? If not, I have a few, but okay. Uh, so first, I would highly encourage P color mesh support as a radar person. <laughs> and for people doing plotting libraries in general, always P color mesh support's nice. Um, and then also, I just want to say that you know anything that wraps Cardify for us to make life easier is usually quite nice. But uh, any other questions? <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Um, so following up on, I guess, it links to both prior questions. Um, that, that gap between the, the declarative to imperative style, do you have any kind of thoughts on being able to take the, the, the form that you've got there and turn that into... Uh, 
code that people could, uh, could run effectively. At least that was my thinking of that's what Paul was asking about. And that's absolutely my, my thinking is turning that back into code, at least in, ter in terms of the declarative style, should be very straightforward. If you're in the imperative one and turning that back into code, that's, yeah, I don't know that we could get there. No, I don't think, if you're, if you're doing imperative style things, it'd be better to maybe slightly expand the declarative API to include another attribute or two that would be readily tracked and serialized rather than to try and do some other god awful hacks I can think of. Are you thinking of uh, making something like this for the processing steps as well so that you could do the declarative and then straight into plotting? So initially, I want to get the plotting just working first. Um, we do have ideas in terms of not so much um, turning calculation functions into these because there's just too many of them, but doing something along the lines of um, you asked for vorticity. Um, and so you can go back through your data set, you see the wind components, and so you can automatically do that calculation based on what you have. And so kind of making some kind of sort of graph type solver for getting the calculation that you want based on the data you have. But that's a, that's a next year, two years down the line problem. Right now it's just get, get this into a state because I think it'll really help um, our users migrate from Gempack into the world of Python. Have you uh, made or thought about making a MIME renderer for that declarative type for your users so that, so that users could just double click in the JupyterLab interface on the, in the file browser and then have, have it open up the plot? I've thought about many ways of integrating better into the notebook of that kind of thing in terms of display. I've not thought about that one. That's an interesting idea. In terms of double clicking though, um, can you actually do that with something that needs to run Python code? You can do anything, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? That's interesting. <laughs> okay, cool. It looks like it's uh, lunchtime then. Go ahead and thank our speaker again.